you have to either get comfortable with the risks you're going to take and believe in your ability to work yourself out of the hurdles that are going to come up because that's what development is. Hello, Architect Nation. Enix Sears here, and welcome back. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architectural practice. If you haven't already gotten access to our f- our free firm owner masterclass, you can do that by heading over to smartpracticemethod.com. At that website, you'll learn this four-step process to be able to structure your practice so that you can spend more time designing and less time on admin. Today, we welcome back to the show uh, an incredible guest. We have Jason Boyer, who is an architect developer who runs currently a studio based out of Phoenix, the Phoenix metro area. Boyer Vertical is the firm's name. And we left off in last episode talking about how over time, and I encourage you to go check out that, that episode for the full story. But over time, early on, Jason began investing in residential real estate uh, from a very young age. And then that eventually rolled and and as he worked full time as an architect working 60 hours a week and putting a lot of a lot of sweat equity his his capital equity was growing as well so jason welcome back to the show great i'm excited for part two here let's jump into it so you have this tell us what's the next step you have this capital that's growing you did you got in some apartment deals now kind of where are you at so um uh, as I kind of noted in, 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 there's kind of two simultaneous paths going on, right? So I'm working in, in, in a kind of big firm, big project trajectory. My, my career slides to a halt, uh, with an unexpected, um, you know, moment in the recession where I find myself out on the, out on the street, uh, looking for a job. And, um, so the, you know, good news is simultaneously I had done enough things and, 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 um, had some things going on with real estate that are bringing in some, some passive income, supplementing income. Um, so I don't really have to get a job right away, but I, I do need to eventually. Right. So I work out my exit agreement with, with my, um, big firm partnership, Um, but it's a time, you know, it's, it's 2012. It's the depths of the recession. Phoenix was one of the last places to come out of it. Oh, it's a bloodbath. Yeah. And, you know, so where where do I, I could have gone to, I interviewed in LA, San Francisco, um, Atlanta, um, and, um, the numbers were all bad, right? Because, the the real estate market here was depressed so i would sell my house at a loss i would move to a higher cost of living area um and it was just bad math and so my wife and i sort of had a, a come to terms with you know what do we do we we sort of we've spent almost 20 20 years building our professional and personal lives in in phoenix do we do we stay here and stick it out and continue that path or do we go somewhere else and um, ultimately, we decided to stay. And part of my workout strategy was to start my own practice. And so um, um, uh, while I was fortunate enough to have a past client come forward and offer me a commission, uh, a university commission um, um, on a campus that I had done a couple of projects prior, um, provided some immediate stability for me to, to start my own practice. And then simultaneously, uh, I've always had this entrepreneurial side of me, which was rooted in real estate. Um, whenever I've worked for a developer, I always sort of treated that as a mentorship moment where I was trying to learn as much as I could from that client. And so I, I, I sort of always gravitated towards uh, having an interest in real estate. And so um, I had expressed uh, interest to some relationships that I had in town that introduced me to some some sites that knew were coming available. They were actually um, like, I think, partially owned by the city of Phoenix, partially owned by the Industrial Development Authority. So these are all kind of like institutional relationships that I had built over time working on big scale projects that knew me and knew my capabilities. And so the things that I had done prior were again, foundational to the things that I, I, the way I was shifting my, my energy and practice and my focus. And so 
while I was still working in, in that kind of mainstream institutional architecture world, um, what I started to do, what ultimately became my first architect as developer project was, um, you know, I was testing ideas on a project site that I had interested in. It was in, in the re residential field, which to me seemed much more accessible. Um, I always, I felt like I could get my arms around it. Um, you know, and keep in mind, I, I have an architectural background. I have two architectural degrees. I have no finance degree. Didn't go to business school. I learned all this stuff uh, looking at others that were doing it before me. Uh, I remember in 2007, I went to L.A. I was one of the first people in the room when um, Jonathan Siegel did his first architect as developer presentation. I think there was 800 people packed into the Civic Center. Uh, of aspiring architects that were interested in what he was doing. Um, and I literally, uh, I met him probably four or five years later, um, but I literally learned from him and my and myself, you know, just, you know, I'd, I'd never done a performa before. Um, and so off I went. So I came up with an idea, I had a concept, the concept was uh, interesting. The the people that owned the property that I was looking at were uh, thought it had merit and value that would contribute to the fabric of the city. They were willing to sell it to me, um, but but uh, it, it was because it was owned by a, a municipal organization. It had to go out for an RFP uh, request for proposal. So it was a competitive bid to get control of the site, um, but. Um, RFPs were something that I was accustomed to doing, working at a larger scale. And so I, you know, I had a good sense of how to put that document together from a, you know, a strategic standpoint and, um, ultimately got control of the site and started to do the project. Well, the easy part for me was the design. Um, the hard part was I didn't know how to ask for money. I didn't know how to get financing. Um, you know, I, the design and construction side I got because that's where I spent my life. Right. But, um, learning, uh, learning how to ask for money and who to go to and the difference between debt and equity and, um, the different types of equity and debt that are out there and available, mostly not available to somebody like me starting, starting up, um, was a really uh, painful but rewarding process uh, that took, geez, a, a year. But ultimately, I got the project funded. Uh, but there was one of these tipping points. So so the first, first development project I did was called Art House. Um, it was a 25-unit condo deal in Midtown Phoenix. It sits at the crossroads of, of downtown and midtown in the arts district. And so it's surrounded by really great amenities. Um, the art museum's next door. It's close to the library. There's a light rail station five minutes away. So I looked at it and said, I, like, I can't lose, right? This is a great site and I know how to deliver good design, you know, so I just want to do good design and in a great location and deliver it at an attainable price point. Um, that sounds, sounds like coherent, right? Sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds but, great. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's really, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it was a hard thing to do. Um, yeah. but I, I will tell you in, in, after having done it, I got it done. It took me a, a lot longer to do it than I expected, but I did mm. get it done and the project was successful from a design standpoint, from a finance standpoint, my investors were um, uh, paid back uh, the, the return that they were promised. Um, and the project went on to win, win a few design awards, which is nice. Um, but I always tell people I, I would have rather have finished it a year earlier. <laughs> mm. um, that, I mean, that sounds in, like an amazing success for you. And a year earlier because? Well, because it, it, time is money, right? So yeah. I had a schedule, and um, the, so the longer it takes, the more interest you pay, and yeah. um, 
Yeah. It was just a different time. It wasn't as robust of a real estate market as it has been over the last, you know, four or five years. How much and, money would you uh, say you ended up making on that deal after all was said and done? Oh, geez. Um, you just had to estimate. I, you know, I've always told somebody that someday I would sit down and show them the path to this. But literally, I could show you over a couple of drinks how that $7,000 I put into the, the, the that first partnership over the course of 10 years. At the time I invested in an art house, it was about 350 grand that I turned yeah. into uh, about 1.8 million in, in return. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. And how does that how does that measure up as developments go? It seems to be pretty impressive, especially for your first development. Is that pretty good? Three hundred fifty k to one point eight. Uh, it's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's okay. it's uh, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. And, so these and were condos, so, and you sold them. Sold them. Yeah. Yep, sold them. A, it was it difficult? Unexpected. It was it difficult to sell all the units? How did that process go? How much did you get involved in the marketing and the the real estate side of that, or did you hand it off to a real estate company and have them do it? I you know I had um, I had pre selected a uh, real estate company to be my sales partner yep. in, in the venture. Yep. Beautiful. And um, um, they seemed like they had the right mindset and experience. And when things didn't sell as fast as they thought they would, as fast as I thought they would, they they left the project. So when what it got mean? hard, uh, oh, they, 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 they said, hey, we're um, out. They said, hey, this is taking too much time. We're not getting it's enough too much time. for our time. <laughs> the entitled real estate right? agents, right? They're like, man, I had to work too hard for that yeah. 3%. I'm, I'm out of here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's another story, but yeah, I'll bet it yeah, is. Yeah, so they jettisoned. Wow. And they, they left. They they left, and I felt like at the time I was dealing with some other stuff. I had I would we had just finished construction. We had closed on the first eight of twenty five units, and um, with construction there there always is some issues. There just always is. So so I was were these pre sales, Jason? So these were pre sales that you were locking in already. I had eight pre-sales. Okay, exactly. So eight pre-sales. Yeah. Great. Okay. So the, so the day we delivered, the, the day I got CFO, yep. within 30 days, we closed the first eight eight homes. Beautiful. Which was which was good. But the, Did that you pay know, for the, the whole development or were you still in the... No, 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 yeah, no. Yeah, probably still in the no, red, no. huh? Yeah. Yeah, not even, not <laughs> 25 even close. 25 units, that's a lot, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you don't, you don't, you know, you, you, I think you're about, we were like 17 or 18 units sold before we paid for, okay. we paid all the debt. Yeah. And then, and then you pay your yourself back, so yourself and all yep. the investors yep. and all the juices in the last two, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So again, one of the, one of the challenges is, you know, you first in, first in, last out. Yep. Um, and, and, um, you know, a lesson learned too is also understanding the difference between a for sale development and a for rent development. Okay. Tell us the important, the important distinctions there. Yeah. Different triggers there. So, um, you know, the things you don't know about for sale that can be really difficult, especially in a condo project is, is, um, the financing of the sales has to be by a bank that's willing to to um, portfolio all of the first loans until you get to 40% sold. So you can't just get any old bank. You have to have a bank with a big balance sheet that understands the condo space um, and is willing to carry those loans on their balance sheet until they can sell them off mm -hmm. to a to another investor or Fannie yeah. and Freddie kind of deal. Um, and, and so I, I had this. I had a moment within Art House where I find, I realized and learned like, well, I might have just developed the whole project and sold them to one buyer, one wealthy mm. guy, family, whatever, out of California that was looking to place some some ten thirty one money, right? And they could have got a nice boutique residential project that they could you know shove ten million dollars into, and just yeah. it would earn earn money for them. Right. Yeah, yeah. I didn't understand that then. Okay. Uh, until it was, it was too late. I was already down the path. I had closed, oh, I uh, I'd closed more than 12 units at that point, And okay. so I had, uh, had a whole batch to sell. Okay. Um, 
you know, it's interesting. It's a, it, real estate like architecture. You're always learning. Yeah. Uh, the difference is that the that the learning experiences can be um, uh, more painful if you're not careful <laughs> and expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, if you can, yeah. you, you kind of jumped, I, I want to go back to the financing. It may be hard for you to answer this because it's been so mm-hmm. so long ago, but uh, do you remember how you put together the financing for that first deal, the art house? I do. Uh, yeah, I do. Definitely. Um, so the the capital stack for the project, I think the total, total capital stack was about round numbers. Let's say it was, it was $7 million. Wow. Um, and the equity debt to equity split was 75% debt. So that means like bank money or private capital money and 25% equity. So if you do the math on that, that's like 5 million in debt and maybe 2 million in, in equity, something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. And um, you can break, there's actually a ULI article on art house specifically about the the funding process beautiful we'll link to that um, in the that show you notes can google and, yeah and find and it explains the the capital stack and talks about some of the some of the pain points along the way for me learning how to raise capital and and whatnot so you know early on when you don't have a lot of experience um you know um money likes experience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, um, when you don't have a lot of it, even though I, you know, I've, I've built some massive projects over, over the years, one being a sponsor of a project I didn't have a lot of experience on and two yeah. rate raising capital and three, my balance sheet at the time wasn't very deep. Okay. Um, and so what a bank likes to see is, um, a sponsor that would be me as the developer that's going to be the general partner of a project that has dollar for dollar assets for the for the loan that they're asking for. Yeah, right? so I'm sure Once you, you have that you can get a loan million. from anybody, right? Yeah. So and you, you had I, you had I, you had 7 much. million in yeah, you had 7 million in real estate holdings at that time, right? <laughs> 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 I wish. Yeah, right. So I didn't okay. have a lot of liquidity. And so ultimately, um, it was a combination of my own personal resilience in deciding whether or not I believed in the project and my ability to do it uh, and um, building relationships with people in, in the finance arena that decided to support the project. Um, and so um, I paid for more expensive debt. So let's say today you could go get a, a, a bank loan on a construction project like Art House in the four to 5% range. Um, back then you might've been able to get it for six, five to six. I paid 10. Wow. Um, which was, you know, that's nearly double. Yeah. Um, some people might even pay more than that. So I had, I had, I, I wasn't quite hard money but it was private capital on, on the, on the equity side. And it came with a lot of teeth into me. So the moment, the moment anything went bad that I couldn't dig myself out on, those guys could come in and take it from me, take the whole deal and take the whole deal and all the benefit that I could potentially reap from it. Yeah. Um, so for me, that first project, it was, it was really, you know, there was a lot of nights where you know, I'd go to bed at 10 cause I was exhausted yep. and I'd wake up at 1230 because everything on my mind would come racing back. Yep. Um, and, um, like I said, you get to a point, you, you have to either get comfortable with the risks you're going to take and believe in your ability to work yourself out of the hurdles that are going to come up because that's what development is. It's, it's literally one hurdle after another. And when you get through two or three, there'll be two or three more new ones that come up in front of you. And it's, you know, how are you going to work through these things? Both the things that you can see and the things that you don't know that are coming at you. Yeah. So those, you know, there's just, um, you know, I look back on that first project and the experience with Art House, and and I tell people, um, it was the most challenging, yet most rewarding, 
um, undertaking I've, I've, I've had professionally and yeah, personally incredible. because it, incredible. you know, it yeah. caused some stresses in our personal life. And it, you know, at the time we had, we, we just had our daughter, um, wow. and, um, but you know, here I am, I'm, I'm here and you can get through it. And, um, ultimately that project and that set of experiences became the foundation for what I'm doing today, which in 2020, um, I made the, made the decision to, um, reboot my career a hundred percent, um, in a way where I'm now wholly focused on, um, uh, being my own client where I'm the architect, uh, where I'm the builder, uh, and developer. And so, um, that first project that I've undertaken in that format, which is a vertically stacked format, thus, thus the firm name Boyer Vertical, um, um, is, uh, was, was Karma and Karma is an 11 home infill deal. Um, and now we're just in the, in the tail end of wrapping that up. So I've got nine of 11 homes, um, sold two still available. We've closed on four of them that have finished construction. And so there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and, and so now, now where I'm at is I'm trying to finish out. Um, I, I know we're going to finish in a good, good spot financially. The project looks good. Um, people that live there love it already, even though there's construction going on around them. And so now I'm in that, okay, I need to be spending more time finding the next deal. Right. And then, so this is, this is just like a, a conventional practice thing, right. Where you're like doing the work, but you need to be marketing the work yep. as a leader. Yep. And so I'm, I'm at that point now where I, I have, um, two different opportunities that I'm trying to chase down and convert uh, into the next project sets. And um, I'm, you know, I've got some money that's starting to come back in. Um, I'm building my team. I'm, you know, trying to get the next set of, um, you know, projects far enough along that I can begin to raise interest on the financing side to, um, you know, it's a, it's a changing world. Real estate's changed a lot over the last, uh, six months. Right. Yep. Um, so you kind of moving with that and, um, it's, it's, it's an interesting time and I'm, I'm sort of at the helm of my, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm living with my choices, right. Good, good and bad and learning from them. And, um, uh, it's, it's exciting and exhausting simultaneously. I'm curious, did you follow Jonathan Siegel's uh, when he sold his portfolio recently to finance another building? Did you follow that? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. knew, I, I knew he, he was, at, we, we were at, my family was actually in San Diego in July. We've started okay. this tradition. Oh yeah. Um, we go to Del Mar every July. Yeah. We rent a, rent a place over there and, just do a working vacation from yep. the beach. Yep. Uh, and so this year I was actually, I was doing some research, actually went and toured a couple of his projects and I, his office happens to, happens to be in one of his projects. And I stopped in, just to, popped in to see if he was there. He wasn't, but his son, Matthew was there. Cool. And um, that the model for the, that high rise they're they're trying to get off the ground in downtown San Diego was, was in the office. Yeah. So I've, I've, um, you know, I followed him pretty closely, uh, and he's certainly part of the reference point that I've had as I've, as I've moved into doing what I'm doing as Boyer Vertical. Beautiful. Jason, what would you say to uh, uh, aspiring developers who want to go into this field and do, do projects that aren't just bottom line driven, but include elements of sustainability, include elements of good design? How, how would someone get started? What's your word of wisdom? It's probably the question you get more than any. Well, I mean, look, I, I tell a couple of things. Um, one, you know, do something that that you want to do and love to do, right? Um, I've always worked really hard. Um, I, I have a Midwest work ethic, so I've always, 
you know, work, work came easy to me <laughs> to, um, and, um, I, you know, I, I would say I'm a, I'm doing what I, what I'm doing because of the things that I've learned and experience I've had as an architect. And so, um, most developers aren't architects, right? So if you're an architect and you're trying to do this, understand that, uh, two things. One, the experiences you will gain as an architect can really help give you a strategic advantage in your ability to um, put to test different ideas quickly, use your own sweat equity as true equity, um, and get get paid for that uh, ultimately, right, um, over time. Um, but also know that to be in the, this position that I've I've you know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be in, it's the things I did outside architecture, the choices I made with investing in real estate, you know, rather than buying a new car or, um, you know, not going on a vacation for years and years and years and, and instead investing in, in, in real estate with the, with the extra money that, that would come up now and then. Um, those choices helped those two things combined are foundational because if you you don't have your own capital put to put into deals, you can't control your deals, and you will also have a a, a smaller investor pool because it, investors like to invest in people that are willing to put their own skin in the game. Yeah. It, at least certainly at, at my scale, where where I'm still, you know, I've 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 done a couple of projects now. They've been successful, but I'm you know I got a lot to learn as a developer certainly as a builder, which is something that I've added to my, you know, to my, uh, abilities. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, just understand that all these experiences can connect and relate to each other and can ultimately support what you're doing if you, if you put them together properly. Um, so, you know, I get, you know, I get young architects ask me all the time, Oh, we want, I want to do development or ASU has this masters of real estate development program. And I'm, I'm asked to come in and guest lecture for them. And I serve as a mentor to, to some of the project teams. And, you know, some people probably do have family money to start from. Some people are already working for a developer. Um, but the, you know, a lot of times the architects are like, well, how did you get started? And I'm like, look, you don't just start. You don't just decide you're going to do this. It's it's a path, and it's a journey. And um, if you don't, I you know, I my both my parents were school teachers in the Midwest. Um, I didn't go without anything. You know, we had, ever you know, we had stuff and it was all good. But I didn't have access by any means. And I tell my daughter all the time because we we're in this fortunate position. We go to we go to Del Mar and do this working vacation thing. And she gets to go to camps at the beach and stuff. And I'm like, look, Kennedy, you don't understand. Like your mom and I never had this. Yeah. And yeah. so you have to understand what a privilege this is. Um, so yeah. again, um, it's about choices and how you put those choices together. Um, and, um, you know, there'll be some pain points that come up along the way and it's, it's how you work through those things. Right. Um, it's, it's easy to, um, you know, it's, it's often easy when it gets hard to run and look the other way and, you know, not follow through. But, you know, for me, I, I was at this point where I, I, I could have easily gone and gotten a job working for an architect somewhere else. Um, and continued in a very traditional sense, I could still do that, but I've, I've made the commitment and I, over the last two years, I can't tell you how many times I've turned down people that have come to me and said, well, we want you, will you design this or we des And I tell them, no, mm. um, that, is, that has to be slight, pretty with, hard with to do. A, well, just because I, I remember when I was sort of there before, but was, I felt like I was afraid, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So at the end of Art House, we skipped over this earlier, but at the after I finished Art House, I was literally on the path to um, keep doing that. I was gonna, that's what I thought I was going to do. I was looking for the next project, and I had uh, a couple of architect friends at the time that approached me and said, "Will you 
come work with us. You know, your experiences can help the practice and blah, blah, blah. And, and um, I've, I, re I reflect on that moment. I tell this, this moment to others. And I'm comfortable saying this, that I was scared to move forward. Um, and um, I think that's why I chose to do that. I was scared and I, and I, and I felt an allegiance to my architectural roots of doing these, you know, larger scale, complex university projects with public and private interests. And I was good at it. Um, but I've, I've got to this point now where I've done that and I've helped others uh, succeed. And I find myself uh, after uh, I help others succeed. And then I find myself in this position where I lose control of that situation. And so now I made the decision that I'm going to focus on a path of success for me and one that supports my goals and my family's goals. And that path is, is rooted in being my own client. And I, I believe that if I choose to take on somebody else's project where I'm not doing the model that I've set out to, to, to focus on, that it doesn't give me, it takes away the time that I need to, you know, work through those, those initial years to, to build up a base of, of practice. You know, it sort of like takes five years to get anywhere in the professional world. You know, you got, you got to work it, work it, work it, work it. And yeah. if you keep at it and you work it, you get to this point where it's a little more comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. you, 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 your relationships are working for you. They're, you're, you're working for them. Um, you're, 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 you're starting to feel the financial benefits of a situation. You feel comfortable, right? Um, and so I, when I'm at that point three years from now, this will be like my third reboot. When I'm at that point th th three more years from now, which will be, so I started this in 2020. When I'm at 2025, I'm optimistic that I'll be in a position where I feel more comfortable, that I have control of my own destiny. That's my goal. And it's yeah. rooted around uh, a business model that's, that's based in architecture, but uh, embraces real estate and construction simultaneously that gives me a you know, bigger, bigger pool of profit centers to pull from. When you say profit centers, you're referring to? Well, architects typically, typically work for fees, right? Yeah. Builders typically work for fees, right? Got it. So the vertical, you're, you're referring to the different, uh, the different services that you're offering along that vertical path. S so a developer's path is often first in. So you're spending, right? Here's yep. the path. Spend, yep. spend, spend, yep. right? And you're, you're last out. I'm trying to yep. keep you on the screen here. Nobody's yeah. going to see a screen. So doing little, doing you're a first in, last a out, right? Yeah. Yep. So you go down before you get back up. So yep. the, the, um, the, f the fee that can be earned in, in architecture can be used to help smooth out that curve the fee that can be used as a built that can as a builder can also smooth out that curve yeah see what i'm saying yep, yep um, got it and so if, if you can balance all those things together um it gives you a little more freedom on the business model standpoint beautiful well right look because forward then to, you can choose yep. to defer a portion of your fee and you know, it just gives you other tools yeah yeah absolutely well, Jason, thank you, and uh, we'd love to go on, but uh, perhaps we could circle back in a year or two when you're at that point. You can update <laughs> us on how things are going since then. I mean, congratulations on well, uh, you know, everything that you're doing right now, and and really putting the, um, you know, your 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 walk on the talk, so to speak. Trying, yeah, it's a daily yeah. daily uh, da daily journey, but um, it's it's good. It's it's good. I'm 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 glad. I'm doing this. I feel good about doing it, and it, but it's not without uh, walking the talk, as you say. Yeah. Well, thanks, Jason, for joining us here on The Business of Architecture. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please 
head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.